Good morning, everybody, and a very warm welcome to this webinar on EC Corporation in connection with EC Corporation Day. Before we get going, we will just wait and make sure everybody from the lobby is joined in the in the webinar room. So we're just going to wait another thirty seconds or so to make sure everyone comes into the to the webinar session. Very good. So it's 10.01 and most of the participants that have been waiting in the lobby room have now entered the webinar. So a very good morning from myself. I am Lisa Esperson. I work for Interreg North Sea Region Programme and we are based uh, in Viborg in Denmark and that is actually where we are sat this morning. And I'd also just like to welcome the first presenter who sat with me here. This is Eva Martinez. And we will come back to you in just a moment, Eva. Thank you. So before we come back to Eva, just a little bit about the background of why we've organised this webinar. Just to give you some, some background, a few technical uh, reminders or issues, and also just an overview of what we're going to be covering this morning. But basically the idea of organising this webinar was because it was European Corporation Day held um, in this week, and so this webinar has been organised in connection with that. And the idea is for European Cooperation Day is it enables interreg programmes to share with citizens what some results and achievements showing what interreg is all about and how cooperation works within regions throughout Europe. So this is organised as part of this European Cooperation Day. And European Cooperation Day is actually quite special this year because it is in fact the 30th year which Interreg has been running. So it makes Cooperation Day a little bit extra special. So the idea of today's event is that we share with you basically an overview about really what Interreg is, where does it sit when it comes to being a European funding stream. We actually have the North Sea Region Programme um, co colleagues with us to share some experience about how their programme works and how it is dealing with challenges that are currently we are currently facing in today's climate. And also we have an interreg project and um, an MEP, but we'll come to the agenda in a little bit. So some technicalities. We all know that, uh, yeah, as we're online and we are many days in these times, there are often technical issues. If you are having problems hearing us or seeing us, it might be that you need to use a different browser and Firefox and Google Chrome work very well. This is actually a webinar, so you can hear and see us, but we can't actually hear and see you apart from the speakers and presenters. But please, please, please don't stop asking questions as we go through the webinar, because we have this chat function on the right hand side of the webinar screen. And we'd very much encourage you and welcome you to submit your questions as we go through the webinar. And we have actually allocated time at the end to come back to as many questions and answers as we can. Please, if you're asking a question, please end it with a question mark because then it will be picked up by the question and answer mode in the webinar system. And also, if your question is directed at someone specifically, please also just state that so we know who, who to aim your question at. You will notice, or maybe you can see, but this webinar is also recorded. So that means that afterwards you can find it on our website and we will also share it um, via our social media channels as well. So that's the practicalities. If you have any other issues listening or, or, or with visuals, please just send us a message in the chat box and we'll try our best to address them as we go along. And just before I hand over to, to Eva, I'd just like to run through the agenda again. I mentioned it at the beginning, but we'll start off with Eva, who will basically set, say what Interreg is all about and set the framework for us. Then we will move over to my colleague, Christian Berth, the head of the North Sea Region Programme, will basically say something more specifically about the North Sea Region Programme, which is one of one transnational cooperation programme. And he will say a bit more about the basically how the programme is functioning in turbulent times that we are in now, such as how the programme is working um, in the times where we have COVID-19 and also the issues of Brexit. Then we actually um, are very pleased to have Rolf Jonsson, and he actually has a project funded in the North Sea Region Programme called Topsoil. 
and he'll be basically explaining how cooperation and working together with different countries is helping their project address the issues of climate change. And finally, we will have a presentation by the MEP, Member of the European Parliament, Morten Helvey, who will be really showing how on a European platform, the value of cooperation and why it matters, why working together between different countries is important. And then we have time for question and answers at the end. And just a quick reminder, if you're asking questions, don't forget to put the question mark, please, at the end of your question. And also, please remember to just say who your question is directed at. Very good. So thank you very much. And I would then just like to hand over to Eva Martinez, who will then say a little something a bit about Interreg and Interact. Thank you very much, Lisa. My name is Eva Martinez. I work for the Interact program. So what is Interreg and what is it good for? I work for Interreg since December 2007, which is a long time, and it has given me quite a lot of awkward moments trying to explain to my family and also friends what I do for a living. Um, I hope those moments have also given me enough training for today in order to answer the question of why, what is Interreg? And very importantly, why is it that after almost 13 years, I still find the, find the energy to come to work every day? I will start with the why. If after all these years, I still come to, the, to my job with a smile on the face, it's because every single day, when I step into my office, I know that I'm there to promote the very thing that makes us humans so successful, cooperation. And if cooperation has put us humans at the very top of the food chain, shouldn't it be also the method um, to create a strong and prosperous and also united Europe? I can't uh, help thinking that uh, something similar must have been in the heads of those men and women who, put, uh, who created Interreg 30 years ago, as Lisa was saying earlier. So what is precisely Interreg? Um, please, next. Interreg is also known as European Territorial Cooperation, and it is the European Union's flagship scheme for cooperation beyond borders at national and also at regional level, and of course for the benefit of all European citizens. Uh, in other words, is next. Um, the mission of Interreg is to bring prosperity to all regions in Europe so that nobody is left behind, and it does it through cooperation beyond borders. Uh, to give you more information, Interreg is also one of the goals of the European Union's cohesion policy. And the aim of cohesion policy is precisely that, is to strengthen economic but also social cohesion in the European Union by reducing disparities between regions. It's quite an important policy of the European Union. It receives roughly 32% of the entire union's budget, and a relatively small part of that goes to fund Interreg. As you can see on the, on the slide, it's about 10 billion euros. This budget comes from the European Regional Development Fund, and it is invested in about 100 different cooperation programs that operate in different geographic areas, and they are responsible for funding projects which is where the interesting bit comes in. So you may be wondering how the projects work, and you can see, we can see that in a bit. Um, basically, it all starts with a problem, right? There is a problem that affects people, that affects, affects territories in at least two different countries. In most cases, it will be more than that, three countries or even more. Um, some partners from those different countries get together, they identify the problem, and they also identify possible solutions that they can put in place together. Once they have that solution, they draw a plan, a joint plan among themselves, where everyone comes with their own specific expertise, and they submit an application to receive funds from one of the cooperation programs, the interreg cooperation programs. The application 
is assessed and if they are lucky and good enough to receive to be approved they then receive funds from Interreg, which can range from 50 to 85 percent of the entire budget of the project. This will depend on the cooperation program. And what is very important is that once that plan is activated on the ground, it will have to have an effect, a positive effect on the territory and the citizens. And in this period of interreg, we're putting a lot of emphasis on looking at the actual effects that those projects are having on the ground. So in which topics does interreg work? You can see quite a few on the screen. In fact, in the current period, interreg is based on 11 investment priorities, and all of them contribute to the Europe 2020 strategy for smart, sustainable, and inclusive growth. I will not go into the details of Europe 2020 strategy, but to keep it very, very simple, it is the European Union's agenda for growth and jobs. So now that you know a little bit about Interreg, you have the big picture in your heads, I can tell you about my own program. It is called Interact, and it's also an Interreg program. So it is also funded by the European Regional Development Fund. But we are a little bit different from the rest of programs in that we don't co-finance projects. Instead, our job is to help people working in other programs to do their job. And we do that through trainings, we do that through all sorts of cooperation platforms uh, where people can come in and exchange their experience and their knowledge together. So in the next slide, you can see um, us, this is us, we are 50 people working across Europe. And all together between us, we cover all the fields of expertise that are necessary to run an interact program. Communication, which is my own field, but also finance, project management, even IT. And where are we based? Um, one of our offices is uh, based here in Viborg, in Denmark. And we have other four offices in Turku, in, in Vienna, in Valencia, and in Bratislava. And our work covers the entire European Union. One of our tasks, apart from supporting, of course, uh, colleagues in other Interreg programs, is to communicate about the good things that Interreg programs have done on the ground for our citizens. And that's why we created This is Europe. This is Europe is a podcast. Uh, where we tell in a documentary style a lot of stories of people who implement projects on the ground, but also very importantly, of citizens whose lives have been improved thanks to interact projects. On the picture, you can see our two reporters. They are called Shahida and Frank. And in the past months, they have been traveling all over Europe to interview um, interact uh, partners, but also uh, citizens be benefiting from the benefits of uh, interact projects. So I would encourage you to go to the podcast, listen to it, and continue hearing success stories from interact. Enjoy the rest of the webinar, and thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Eva. That was very, very informative. Thank you. So we hand over from now uh, Eva, and very much welcome Christian Beareth. He is the head of the North Sea Region Programme, and he'll mention a little bit now about how the programme is operating in some of the difficult times that we are currently finding ourselves in. Welcome, thank Christian. You. Thank on. you very much, Lisa. Yes, my name is uh, Christian Burek, and I'm head of the Secretariat here in, in, in Bibok. I'm here to talk a little bit about the two sort of main challenges that we are going to, that we are facing in, in these days. Now, the first one is obviously Brexit. Brexit is an obvious challenge to all of us, and uh, not least to the North Sea uh, region. Uh, and, uh, well, we have to say um, it's not entirely cast in stone, but the UK has already formally left the European Union, and uh, they will also do it in practice by the end of this year. Personally, I've enjoyed very much working with the, with the UK uh, in the more than... Uh, um, 20 years that I've been working in with European cooperation. This is both covered national uh, and regional and local level. 
There is, has, however, in the last uh, approximately seven years, developed a gap, uh, quite visible gap, between what happens on government level and what happens on local, regional, and project level in the UK. The top level, the national level, has increasingly been describing to a return to the old uh, philosophy of standard isolation, turning their back at uh, Europe and cooperation. This is completely different on ground level. Uh, on ground level, it has proven even people have been proven even more eager than ever to participate in projects addressing the challenges that are facing all of us around the North Sea, like decreasing biodiversity, uh, toxic substances in the sea basin, and the transition from uh, uh, fossil fuels to more uh, sustainable fuels, like, for example, hydrogen. There's no doubt, however, that the um, British contribution on project level will be missed immensely in the community around the North Sea. Another very practical thing is that um, Brexit will mean that uh, transnational cooperation will be cut with about 30% in terms of budget. It's already happened as part of the uh, budget deal in the, in the EU. And uh, for, um, for our bit, um, the North Sea Region Programme, we are expecting a cut of about 40%. So it, it, it is affecting us, uh, but it's not killing us at all. Now, Brexit is not just a bad thing. I think that's really important to, to bear in mind, because it gives the rest of us, the remaining countries, uh, and, a, and a unique uh, opportunity to reinvent ourselves to re-intensify cooperation. There is today an increasing awareness, which wasn't there just a few years ago, that cooperation doesn't come by itself. Uh, and we have seen an increasing determination on project level to continue to develop good projects. Projects that goes beyond the immediate surroundings and maybe stretching over five, six, even seven countries, uh, and thereby increasing the effects of the project. That's really important and very positive. One of our many challenges in the next program period, and also in general, uh, is of course climate change. The climate sees no borders, like Interreg, um, and individual actions in individual countries simply will not cut the mustard. They're important, but we have to cooperate to get to, the, to get to grips with this very important and very serious challenge. Now, another challenge that we're facing is the corona. Uh, like everyone else, our program is very much affected by it. Uh, and what we thought initially was, how will this affect our projects? You know, all these lockdowns that we're all facing, how will it, uh, how will it affect our projects? Um, and we knew that, you know, all our stakeholders have been facing exactly the same problem. How do we cooperate if we cannot see or meet each other. That's really, that's, that's really a new thing. As it turned out, projects were affected, but not in the way we thought. Many of them, of course, many of the more tangible uh, activities uh, had either been postponed or has been in some cases de delayed, um, or has been canceled. Um, but um, there's been a massive development on various digital solutions. Meetings have, of course, been uh, turned from physical meetings to online meetings, but this, the transition has gone beyond that. An example of this can be found in one of our projects called Reframe, which aims at helping local food producers to get their products to the market. In their case, the corona crisis has tr triggered a range of new and exciting uh, initiatives. For example, in Sweden, the Reframe project has uh, been helping local food producers to join a network of, for selling products directly uh, to consumers through an online offer ordering system. And in the Netherlands, they've gone even further. They've developed an online uh, uh, work tool providing support to farmers to, to sell local food boxes to local consumers. The boxes I have to say, sold just in the first week 700, which is some really significant to a local community. Now, Corona is a challenge to all of us, 
uh, and none of us know when we will see the back of it. But while it's here, it's so crucial that we keep going and do not despair. For me, one of the most important le lessons learned is that it is important to have friends out there, people you can call either for advice or for help. And having worked with Interreg and Transnational Corporation for more than 20 years, I have a lot of friends out there in Europe and they haven't let me down. We must not, we, we may not be able to meet in the same way we've done before, but we can still cooperate. And after all, Interreg is about cooperation and finding ways to cooperate. The Corona crisis illustrates more than anything that if one door closes, many new and undiscovered doors will open. Thank you. Thank you very much, Christian. That's very, very interesting insight into how the Nossi program is taking on board the issue of COVID-19 and the Brexit. So thank you very much. Very good. So before we go to our next speakers, we actually have a quiz prepared for you to in a way keep you on your toes and just to see how much you know about kind of cooperation um, and so we'll put this on the screen and ask you please to fill in the the quiz that is now on your screens and it would also let us know if you've been really studying the screen and listening to, as we've been talking through the presentation so we'll give you a few minutes to to fill in the questions here Some of the questions are easier than others. Others, I think, particularly one of them, you have to think a bit. So let's wait a few more seconds and then we can have a look at the results of the quiz. I just see who's still participating. I think people are still filling in the quiz. Yeah. Start to bring the, the quiz to a close and have a look and see what the responses look like. I was very pleased to see this morning that there were almost 100 people registered for this webinar, so I thought that was a really great, uh, great sense of enthusiasm we got for people wanting to join and learn more about European cooperation and more specifically Interreg. So that was a great sign. So let's have a look at the results then. Um, I just need to scroll so I can see what's coming on the screen. Let's see, let's have a look here. Okay, how many Interreg programs are there at the moment? Over 100 is the correct answer. So for those of you that tick that box, that was the right answer because there are in fact many different types of Interreg programs. The second question, the right, correct, the correct answer, and uh, Eva actually mentioned this in her presentation that we are mainly financed through the European Regional Development Fund, and that's otherwise commonly known as ERDF, as short. And why, what key tri tri event triggered um, the adoption of Interreg transnational programs? And that was actually the correct answer, European flooding disasters. And that was actually because there was a need to cooperate beyond boundaries mm -hmm. to address the problems that were created as a result of these disasters. How much EU territory is covered by transnational programs? And that is in fact 100% because all of Europe is in, in covered by transnational cooperation programs. Transnational cooperation, sorry. And finally, the last question. Well, that was a bit of a trick question. So we were a bit mean there, but they were all right, in fact. So it was all three points that were on the question five were correct. So thank you very much for participating. Hopefully, um, yeah. You learned a bit more or tested your, your own knowledge mm -hmm. filling in the quiz. Great. Yeah. Then I would then say I'd like to hand over to Rod Johnson from the Topsoil Project. Um, let's see if he's available yet. Otherwise, we can have a look at some questions that might have come in at this stage. Yeah. yeah. While we wait for Rod, let's have a look at some of the questions that we have come in at this stage and see if we can answer them. 
So, okay, thank you very much. We have one here. I'll just read it out. To which extent do people um, or your projects aim? Sorry, to which extent do the people your projects aim for are involved in the projects in order to match with citizens' expectations and not imposing an idealised version of what should be in Europe? And that was to, to you, Ava. So I think about mainly how are the projects involve people? Yeah, so how much probably the decision making I think do they have as well, I'm guessing, in the project's design? And there are pretty uh, good number of projects which involve citizens in their decisions, in their making. And I'm thinking especially of those projects who deal with, uh, for example, city planning, and um, other issues that affect directly people. So they, it is a factor that is included in many projects. Uh, so it's not only a few partners, a few experts getting together and finding those solutions, but very often is a co-creation activity, especially when it affects uh, directly uh, the citizens. And the solution, I mean, sometimes the problems are very on the ground, aren't they? That yes. The people are address them. Exactly. And the other important thing to consider when we talk about the, the vision about Europe is that one thing that uh, um, is special about the Interact projects is that not only the solution needs to be a joint one, but also uh, the, the solution needs to um, have a positive impact in all the territories involved. Mm -hmm. uh, so cooperation goes from the identification of the issue to the identification of the solution and to the benefit that needs to be shared by all countries. So I hope this answered the question. Great, thank you very much, Ella. Thank you. Thanks, thanks. Let's see if we can take another question. Okay, this was um, from Peter. How much money an organization needs to put into a project budget? In other words, uh, what is the own contribution rate of a project? This varies, as I said earlier, it depends from program to program. So we, we go from 50% in the current period till 85%. So it will depend on the rules, specific rules of each program. Okay. And the rest of the budget needs to be brought in by, uh, by the partners. Thank you. Thanks, Eva. Thank you very and much. I can see now we have uh, Rod Johnson from the Top Scope Project. Good morning, Rod. Good morning. Thank you for joining. Yeah, thank you for having me here. More than welcome. So we will hand over to you now, uh, Rolf, to say a little bit more about how cooperation helps you function in topsoil. And uh, yeah, I won't say more. I hand over to you. Thank you very much. Thanks. I assume you have my presentation here. And uh, thank you for, again for having me. I'm a head of office in the central Denmark region, a region that deals with re regional development. I work a lot with climate adaptation, climate change mitigation, and also resources. Um, the talk I would like to give you here is uh, give, taken from an example of an interact project called Topsoil. It's a project about climate uh, change adaptation. So how the society deals with uh, the changes that we are going to see in the future, uh, more heavy rain events, more uh, sea level rises and so on. So if you take the next, I have I put in here some examples here. Uh, well, what, what we are facing is, is of course, more more water in especially in in winter time and less in summer more extremes which which can cause drought uh, we are also dealing with uh, co water quality and shortages of, of drinking water in the future and we are dealing with soil deterioration and in erosion um, as a factor that we are dealing with in the topsoil project and on top of that we are also dealing with groundwater flooding the flooding that comes from beneath uh, when the rain events are getting more and more and we are going getting higher infiltration. So this is what we're dealing with. And if you take the next, um, on the left-hand side is a map that shows seven different interact North uh, Sea projects uh, that are dealing with climate change adaptation. And uh, you can see all the dots there are pilot areas. On the right-hand side, you see the pilot areas that are uh, in 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 uh, in action in topsoil project, and you see there sixteen different pilot uh, areas that are all dealing with climate change adaptation and groundwater. So our focus is on groundwater and the water beneath our feet. And if you take the next one, you will see here why is 
why is groundwater, uh, how is that interlinked with the water cycle? Well, um, we have on the left-hand side precipitation. The precipitation can either run off in rivers and then it can go in infiltrating into the groundwater systems and the groundwater systems has their own life and the, it is run by the ar architecture or the geology, hydrology in within the aquifers there leading out to the sea. Changing pre precipitation due to climate change will cause change in infiltration um, and another factor that we're also looking upon is sea level changes is also affecting into the groundwater system. So these two factors are important for us uh, on to, uh, to look at, at, at climate change. So uh, if we take the next one here, what we are dealing with in the topsoil project is, is making measurements. And we need tools for that. And we, the measurements are used, and you see uh, four different examples on the pictures there on the right side, where we are dealing with land-based uh, measurements, we are dealing with sea-based measurements, and we're dealing with uh, a, a, a something called, it's geophysics that we're working with, which can actually measure uh, the architecture, the geology of the subsurface. And the instrument at the, at the bottom there is called TTEM, and it's developed within the topsoil project. So it's a new way of measuring, and you get very high resolution. And on the left hand side, you see uh, models that we are making on top of the data we are collecting. And this is very important to know the structure there, to understand the flow and how the flow is affecting our lives on top of the surface. So take the next one, please. This is an example on uh, how we are then using the data. In the middle, you see a field where there's growing vegetables. You see, uh, you see also areas where we are actually pumping in water into tubes. Um, it's an area in, uh, in the Netherlands where uh, sal salinity is a high uh, risk of the vegetables there. So by introducing fresh waters uh, into the aquifers, we're then, we're then able to lowering the saline uh, waters within the groundwater aquifer and then the vegetables can grow even better. On the right uh, picture there, we are also making a new tool that can change erosion and lower the erosion on fields. So these are just concrete examples on how we are using uh, the models and the, the measurements we're dealing with in new ways of uh, managing our subsurface. So take the next one, please. Another very important way uh, that we're working in this, these interact projects are the transnational and cross-sexual cooperation. It is, um, it is here shown by, uh, we are dealing with it in, in a cooperation where we have meetings on top. We see the whole uh, consortium uh, uh, meeting uh, and a picture there on the, you can see workshops and we are also in the fields looking at the challenges. And on the left hand, hand side, you'll see a picture of uh, a bus trip where we are also dealing with the challenges and visiting each other. So cooperation is very important and the transnational cooperation is a way of taking a challenge into uh, this international setting and making answers together. So take the next one, please. This is another way of showing it. Uh, it's a network diagram where you can actually see our challenges uh, and uh, all the different pilots that are working on the challenges. And then you can see how it's interlinked in the different uh, uh, arrows that are uh, shown on the map. So this is just to give you an example on how cross-border, cross, -border, cross, uh, cross uh, challenges we are we are working here. And it's knowledge exchange. It's it's about uh, getting uh, expert knowledge. And um, the good thing is that we have different backgrounds. A lot of us are, are based on natural sciences, but also a lot of on, on human science. So it's it's a good mix. And uh, we really get get forward there. Let me take the next one then, um, because we are we are taking uh, not only the challenges but also standing on uh, who who are good at what. And if you you look here, so then the UK experience is that they are very good at stakeholder involvement. They know how to do that, and we learn from them. In Denmark, we are very good at measurements, SkyTem, and the geology I, I was showing you. And in Germany, they are good at saltwater intrusion and understanding how saltwater is affecting groundwater aquifers. In, in the Netherlands, it's more 
how to reduce flood risks in urban areas. And in Belgium, it's buffering storage of groundwater. So we have different areas where we are, uh, we have ex expertise and we are using that to get more integrated approach uh, approaches and uh, how we're dealing with climate change scenarios, making new, uh, also making suggestions on new legislation and also giving uh, Europe, Europe uh, a, a back kick uh, on uh, how they can change the directives. So this is just some of the areas we're working together on. We take the next one, which is the last. I would also like to stress how important that Interreg is when we are dealing uh, with development of new tools here. As I mentioned, this, this TTEM setup is, is made uh, within Topsoil, and now it's actually commercialized through a company and is uh, starting to work uh, operating uh, worldwide. So it's a huge success, I would say. Uh, sorry for uh, underlining huge, but I would say that because it's very important. We have a platform, a playground where we can actually develop these new, to new, new tools and learn uh, across each other, but also starting to commercialize some of the methods that we are using. Um, and I would like to be that the last words here and, and shift to the next and say thank you very much for your attention. Uh, I hope you found it interesting. Great, thank you very much, Rolf, for that. And congratulations with the TTEM. Um, that seems like a, a brilliant achievement from the project, so well done. Thank you. Thank you. Great, so thank you very much to Rolf for then giving us some information about the, the Topsoil project and learning how important it is for them to cooperate as part of their project activities. The next speaker, I don't know, I'll just check, look across uh, with my colleague, who I believe he is here with us today, is Morten Helvey, the member of the European Parliament. Good morning, Morten. Oh, just checking that we can hear you okay. I don't think we can hear you this end. Maybe just check your speaker, there's the microphone. We can see you, but we can't hear you. Let's see. See if we can. Seems to be a bit of an issue with the sound. So let's just see if we can. Uh, work with this just a few seconds here while we try and. Hmm. What we might do is just. Maybe Morton, we basically we can see, but we can't we can't hear you. There's no sound from your end. <laughs> um, Is this better? That's perfect. Now uh, we can hear you. So sorry, so sorry for not having okay, pushed no. the, uh, the the right button. You press the right button. That's the important thing. <laughs> <laughs> Good morning. Welcome. Thank you. Yeah, so I, I have said to uh, Morton Helvey, Member of the European Parliament, very good morning and welcome. And um, I believe you're just going to now touch a bit upon why cooperation is important from a more European perspective. Sure. So I'd like to hand over to you to, to say something more about that then, please. Thank you so much and uh, thank you for uh, in, in inviting me and uh, uh, apologies for, uh, for, for, for the technical delay. One should think that we were used to these virtual meetings by 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 now, but uh, but unfortunately no. Anyway, thank you so much for 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 having me. I I find this topic and 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 also the specific example just given by the previous speaker to uh, demonstrate perfectly well why uh, cooperation cross borders are are, are so important as as uh, is uh, the case. Uh, now now I'm in in my daily life. Uh, uh, working uh, virtually uh, with Brussels uh, out of Copenhagen, not having traveled to, to Brussels for like six months or so. Uh, it, it is uh, it is really uh, important that, that we have projects like this. Uh, I, I work uh, on a daily basis with uh, climate and energy issues and, 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 and cooperation on the North Sea and, and with North Sea a country's bordering the North Sea is, is absolutely vital in ensuring this uh, transformation, this green transformation that, that we're pursuing. And, and the North Sea is, is so interesting for, for, for so many reasons, but not, not least because, uh, I mean, this, uh, the North Sea region, region could turn out to be like a, a powerhouse, the power hub of, 
of not only Northern Europe, but, but also beyond uh, this. And in order to uh, achieve this, in order to fulfill these ambitions, we obviously have to, uh, to work even harder to foster cooperation cross-border in, in the North Sea uh, region. If, if Europe is going to be climate neutral by 2050, we have like uh, to, to expand uh, capacity on the North Sea with like a factor of 20 or so in, in, in offshore wind. And this requires uh, closer cooperation between the North Sea countries within the North Sea region. And, and this is not an easy thing to do because there are so many technical issues, there are so many legal issues, uh, there are so many governance issues that, that has to be addressed where, uh, for obvious reasons, you would have different uh, national traditions and, and ways of, of doing things and, and bringing countries together uh, around the North Sea in the North Sea region is, 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 is so bloody difficult and, and, and so important in order to uh, fulfill our, our, our climate uh, ambitions. And I, I think there's a, a general point to be made here, a general overall point, uh, saying that if we are not on a European level able to agree on, say, targets or measures on a pan-European level, the regional issues, the regional examples are going to prove or will prove themselves even more important in the future. Uh, the regional or local even examples uh, are, are going to be so important in leading the transition, in leading by example, because if you have, and this is what we see, unfortunately, in my own opinion, we, we have a lack of will in many countries of obtaining and getting pan-European solutions, then you would see regional examples, regional cases, regional projects rising in importance, given that the central level and the pan-European level would not be able or capable of reaching a consensus on various issues. This could be green issues, climate issues, it could be all other kind of, 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 of political issues. But the regional level is going to be even more uh, important as well as cities and, 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 and also uh, local projects. So uh, projects like uh, Interreg uh, uh, are, are extremely important. It's important in terms of, of leading the way of, of, of showing what can be done on a regional level and thereby hopefully also inspiring to even more progressive solutions and projects on, on, on a, a central level. So I really congratulate you on, 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 on the good work that you are doing and I hope to see even more good cases and projects because it is really inspirational and really an important dimension, important thing in, in, in reaching true solutions to the problems that, that we're facing uh, commonly. So uh, I'd say good luck and, 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 and keep up the good work. We need this uh, and, and, and we need this also in the light of what's going on with Brexit uh, on, on, on the North Sea to still maintain good and close cooperation uh, across borders and thereby also uh, inspiring on a central level. So thank you so much for, for, for having me. Uh, and and uh, I'm, I'm 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 happy to to uh, learn more and listen more to to the good examples that that uh, and good projects that that you're doing. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Morgan. That was very great to to learn and to to hear about your support as well for cooperation and the role of Interreg in a European uh, perspective. So thank you very much. Thank you. Great. So we've heard now from from our speakers. We've received uh, some knowledge about Interreg in general. We've heard about how the North Sea program is working to address the current issues on the horizon, such as, or not on the horizon, but that are with us, like Brexit and COVID-19. Rolf Johnson from Topsoil Project gave us some information about how they use cooperation to work in their project. And now Morton has kindly um, outlined really the importance of Interreg in a more European setting. So hopefully you now have a really good idea of what we're all about and how Interreg is, is set and operates and it's a lot to do with cooperation and uh, that's very we're very pleased we can order, organize this webinar then in connection to European Cooperation Day which was actually the beginning of the week so we have plenty of time now for some questions and I can see you've been really clever and you've written the names of the speakers most of the questions coming in as we've asked you to have got the names of the speakers written off to them and you've included question marks so we know that they're questions so 
lots of questions. Uh, I think we should get down to having a look at some of them and seeing if we can get some answers to some of the questions that we have coming in. So we will... Um, Rob, show this camera. Yeah, maybe Rob, you can come up on the camera too, so then we can have all the presenters on the screen at the same time to, to take through this question answers bit now. Very good. And Ava, maybe, yeah, but yeah. Let's see what questions we come up, and Ava and Christian will join, join me by my, in the empty chair currently. So let's have a look and see at some of the questions we have had coming in throughout the seminar. And thank you very much for your, your inputs. So, um, so Ava, this is for you. Um, Liliana, it says to Ava Martinez, can you give some examples project, of projects led by your office? Thank you for the question. Very interesting one. There are plenty of examples. I gave an example earlier with the Interreg podcast. That was a project that I led personally, so it's really close to my heart. Uh, but to give you perhaps another very different example, I can talk about uh, another one we have in terms of harmonizing implementation tools. And, and that is particularly interesting for those who want to apply for projects, because the aim of this uh, project is precisely to make the rules of more than 100 programs as similar as possible so that partners don't have to learn very different rules when they apply for funds with different projects, programs, sorry. Yeah, I think it's one of my favorite uh, pieces of work you're operating on, because for an applicant, it's certainly much nicer to, to if you're, it doesn't matter which program you're applying in, that the systems and rules are the same. So yeah, it's a great initiative. Thank you very yes. much, Eva. Thank you. Okay, so please. question then. Um, Christian, please, I think this is, see, um, this is from Selena. Is it possible that the UK still participate in interreg projects after Brexit, just like in Switzerland as part of the uh, Alpine Space Program? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Right. Uh, well, we had hoped for that for, for a long time, but uh, I think it was uh, in the beginning of the year, the UK government made it very clear that they had no intention of participating in any uh, cooperation programs except the peace program. Uh, and uh, that's where we are at the moment. We know that there are, shall we say, a lot of, of uh, interesting movements going on, uh, for example, in Scotland, who are very keen on participating in, in these kinds of, of uh, projects in the, in the future. But where it will end, it will all depend on, on how they manage to fight it up between them within the UK. Um, our door is open, but uh, it doesn't seem that they want to come in. Thanks. Thanks, Christian. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Um, I think Eva, back, we have to switch back to Eva because uh, Maria asks a question. I think Eva can answer this one. Do you have, um, do you have programs, uh, are we, do we have programs that work with education and preschools? So, Well, to start with, Interreg is not focusing necessarily on education per se, but there are examples of projects that have um, worked with uh, schools and preschools in particular when it comes to bridging the gap between border and regions in particular. So helping children on both sides of the border, for example, with uh, language skills and socializing with the neighbor who is next door. Um, again, in, in our podcast, we have an entire uh, episode uh, focused on youth and uh, some of the most touching stories that we have uh, encountered on the ground have to do with preschool uh, children. So I invite you to listen to it and, and learn more about it. Great, thanks Thank very you. much, Eva. Um, there's another question here, let's have a look. I think this is back to Christian, it's from Gaza. It was mentioned that Brexit is a challenge for environmental cooperation. Is Interreg system of cooperation and limited to EU member states, excluding partners such as EE um, countries? Well, yes and no. Uh, it is clear that uh, the uh, the EU is a club for member states, uh, and uh, if you're not a member of the EU, then you're not part of the club. But we do have, for example, in our program, we have uh, Norway, who is uh, not a member state, uh, but who have decided to want to cooperate with, within our uh, program. And they have been with us since the beginning. So it is, it is possible. Uh, I know that there are similar cooperations going on between uh, 
one of the, our, our sister programs uh, working in the north of uh, of the Scandinavia, who are very much involved with uh, with Russia. Uh, so yes, it is possible, but of course, the main focus is within the EU. Uh, that's that's that is where our our heart lies, really. Thank you very much. Okay, let's see. We have one to Rolf here. Rolf has actually had to leave, so his colleague uh, Fleming Jonsson. I think he is. Um, can you can you hear us, Fleming? I'll just check that you're there. Uh -huh. Okay, let's see if we can try. Oh, here, here he's coming now. So we'll just wait a few seconds, and then um, Fleming, who is representing uh, on behalf of Rolf from the Topsoil Project. Hi, Fleming. Hi. Hi. This is a question to Rolf, but then we redirect it to you. Um, what do you see from the data you measured so far? How does the groundwater levels change in the North Sea region? That's from Peter. Yeah, thank you. Um, the groundwater level actually changes uh, differently throughout the region. Um, in Denmark, for example, uh, we have areas where the groundwater level rises. Uh, and here we are facing already now facing problems uh, with this for example flooded fields as uh, you saw a picture from pres the presentation of Rolf and also flooding in urban areas but in other areas in the region uh, for example also in Denmark in the eastern part of Denmark we will in the future see a shortage of groundwater and this is also the case in uh, in actually most of the other countries uh, that are participating in the project. So here we we have a, a lowering of the groundwater level and, and a lack of groundwater in the future. Great, thank you very much for that, Fleming. Precise answer. Let's see any, I'm not sure any more questions coming up now, this one here. Um, Cecilia, could you shed some light on the future of Interreg, also topics of interest and employment um green as i'm assuming that means more the green and environmental issues health etc so the future of interreg hmm. well i think can... maybe it might be a split between uh eva and, and eva and i i can tell you a little bit about uh, what we expect for our own pro uh, program uh we are in the middle of preparing the uh, new program for the north sea region it will start at some point uh, next year and run for a seven-year period. Um, and the main focus of this will be simply the environment, the green transition, and, and also uh, economic development within that, shall we say, framework. Uh, so it's, uh, it's very much uh, sort of directed towards trying to change uh, in, in, in our, uh, our program. Uh, but there's no doubt that the uh, corona crisis and the, shall we say, the economic downturn, which is not unlikely to happen as a result of it, uh, and already happening in, in many places in Europe, will have an effect on it. So it's basically how can we implement the green transition and still be able to create new jobs? I think that's that's the main uh, topic in, in our program. Do you want to say something more, Ian? Yeah. I think uh, Christian has put it really well and it applies also to the other interact programs but perhaps one reminder to make to those interested in, in knowing more about interact and interact programs is that um, a lot of these issues and how COVID-19 and how Brexit is going to affect the shape of programs is still ongoing the negotiation uh, with the European institutions are still ongoing, so we can't anticipate a lot on their behalf. But those topics that are affecting now European society are, are pretty much pretty hot on the table. Uh, we don't expect an answer before the end of this year. So if you're interested in following up the news, like that's the, the time frame. Thank you very much, okay. Eva and Christian, for jointly answering that question. Um, there's a question now directed at Rolf, which we direct, we redirect to Fleming. It's from Jens. Are your projects open source for other regions um, to easily access and, and therefore engage in knowledge exchange? If so, are there similar projects in other parts of the re other regions that you can um, get helpful free knowledge? So I guess this is the transfer of knowledge between projects within programs. So um, over to you, Fleming. 
Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, perfectly. Okay, thank you. Good. <clears throat> yes, um, I think that everybody, everything is is available on our website, so everybody is welcome to to download and and have a look at at the results we have shown on our website. Um, and of course, we are very keen to share our, our results. Of course, this, I guess this is what it is all about: this uh, interact program and and the projects. Um, and then I would say that we have. Uh, collaboration with a lot of other projects. Among those are, of course, uh, the other seven climate change adaptation projects um, we have in, in the Interreg North Sea program. Um, and yeah, and then we also have uh, collaboration with projects uh, in in other countries. Actually, also uh, with in the US and and elsewhere in the world. So we collaborate a lot, uh, not only within the region, but also uh, further away. Thank you very much, Fleming. I think it's true to say that all projects have to have uh, open, their results have to be open and shared. So um, a lot of our projects are actually yeah, sharing results and exchanging between different programs and regions. So yeah, and thanks for your input too, Fleming. Okay, I think we have maybe just time for one more question. Um, keeping an eye on the time a bit now because we're approaching uh, 11 o'clock. But this is to the North Sea Region program. So, Christian. And mm -hmm. um, so many students are educated to think as much as providing, sorry, as much as providing a world a better place. Would you be able to give a motivated speech to some students in the near future about, for example, another webinar? So many students. I'm just reading the question because it's a bit long. Uh, would you be able to give a motivated speech to some students in the near future? For example, would we be able to give another webinar? Yeah. If, yeah. We, if we can help, we would be very happy to do that. Exactly. No problem at all. Yeah, yeah. that would be great. And Anyone maybe, who yeah. cares to listen to us. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> you can, you can, um, we have, um, uh, of course, a website, the North Sea Region Programme, and um, if you, you can look up all of our contact details on there. I'm Lisa Esperson and Christian. Just, uh, you can send us an email and ask us uh, for your wishes for such a webinar, we'll have a good look into it because it's certainly uh, it's quite an easy thing to easier thing to organise these days now that we're just we can do something yeah. online. So yeah. Yeah. yeah, very good. Then I think we have maybe just one more question, maybe a short one more question, or I'm just seeing across the road one more question here, and then we will start to say thank you and close for the for the session. <laughs> That's good. Just a quick question. Does Interreg offer any kind of internships to students? That's from Lola. Yeah, and uh, the very short answer is yes, we do. Uh, if you want to uh, have an internship with us, you will simply uh, contact us and we will see if what, we can, what we can arrange. Uh, it varies a little bit. Sometimes we have, we have spaces, sometimes we, we, we haven't got, but, uh, but every, anyone is welcome. I've certainly seen it actually from the other programs often yeah. on uh, post for internships as well. Yeah. yeah. Very good. So I think uh, before we end, it comes to my thank you to the both the presenters and you listeners and attendees of this webinar. But a big thank you to Eva, Christian, Rolf Fleming as well, and uh, Morton Helvey for joining the webinar today and sharing your ideas and thoughts about Interreg and cooperation. And thank you, dear participants, for joining and listening through. And very much thank you for all your questions because there have been some great questions coming in this morning. And just one final remark before we go. When we finish now, please don't close your browser because there will, in fact, come up a short survey we would like to ask you to complete. It doesn't take very long but just your reflections on the webinar. So please don't just uh, close everything down. Just when this ends, it will automatically come up in your browser, link to the survey. It doesn't take very long to fill in. And we really appreciate your feedback because of course, we're finding our way forward in this world of online uh, yeah, joy. So anything we can do to improve future webinars and events, we will try and take on board your comments. Thank you very much, everybody, and we look forward to maybe seeing or hearing from some of you again in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. Bye. Bye.